Welcome back to the Fly Culture Podcast. It's good to have you here and think this might be the 250th episode. The magazine is now six years old, 250 podcast episodes. Where the hell did that go? Let's move on to the podcast anyway. I met my guest a few weeks back at a stag party for our good friend. It was a fishing stag party and we were all splitting up, having a fish, then aiming back for a barbecue later that day. He said he'd be head- heading to a small stream. John Applin heard this, looked at me, nodded, and I quickly jumped into his car. It was his home water, and although he fished a tiny bit, he proudly showed me some great spots where I even managed a few fish. He- here's a really interesting story that I thought you'd like to hear, and so I'm pleased to say a big welcome to the podcast to Richard Miller. Richard, it's great to have you along on the podcast. Are you well? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, uh, Pete. Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, that was a good. Uh, that was a good first date we had, <laughs> as first dates go. <laughs> um, yeah, I should tell you, I don't do many. Fir- I don't do any first dates these days. I've been happily married for uh, thirty-three years, I think it is. So, um, but yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a good day. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we had a, we had a good time, and I showed uh, showed you around, as you say, very proudly of my home water. Absolutely. And that, that small stream, you know, as I said, John, look, I, I saw him try and catch my eye. And I just love these fascinating little waters that you get to fish and you think, right, who's home? And I spooked a few fish and I saw the puffs of dust. And on the river, it's probably, what was it, four or five feet wide at, at the widest, probably, wasn't it? Yeah, it, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've listened to your podcasts, uh, Pete, but I, I didn't recognise you in the little group that I gathered. And it was only when you got in the car, I thought, I think I know this guy and uh, it's going to be, yeah, I'm going to enjoy it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we, we headed uh, quite a long way from where the rest of the guys were. They were fishing middle of the river and we were a bit further upstream in a little uh, secret spot. <laughs> Yeah, we won't we won't name places, but we're going to get a sense a little bit now. So that for listeners, can you tell us where you're based and what that means from a fishing perspective for you? Uh, I'm based in Dorchester. Um, I'm uh, Dorset born and bred, so uh, Dorchester is my hometown. Has been forever, uh, well, nearly ever. I'm a I'm a farmer's uh, son. Uh, but live in town now, actually, um, which is uh, the first house that uh, I've had, we've had, my wife Mandy and I uh, have had in town. And we were a bit um, uh, curious about how we would find life in town, but we absolutely love it um, and wouldn't change it for the world. We're, we'll never move from here. Um, it's uh, it's a lovely place. Uh, and Dorset and Dors- Dorchester is, uh, is great. We love it. Yeah, absolutely. I stayed overnight there in the premier in i think it was and just walked across the road had a good burger had a walk down the high street and it's got a very nice feel there it's, it's a, a lovely town isn't it yeah it is yeah very much so um the the retail is not what it was but then that's the same for every town um but everyone knows each other around the town um uh we got in well with our uh neighbors and friends around uh and it's yeah it's got a good vibe and it's close to the river um yeah, on a on an evening, I can come home from work, um, get in the waders, <laughs> walk down the high street, get a few odd looks, uh, naturally. But I can I can step out into the meadow. Uh, the north side of the town is is uh, fronts onto the river meadow, which of course floods in the winter, so there's no development out that side. Um, and so that's only two hundred yards away. And there's uh, yeah, some of our best bits of fishing are just uh, within a stone's throw, really. Yeah. So I think we need to delve into this a little bit more deeply because you said that you moved into town, yet you're 200 yards away from the river. Was that a very, very lucky coincidence or was that carefully planned? It, it wasn't carefully planned, actually. No, we, we found this house. We wanted to be in a quiet bit of town. We we lived in a village um, east of Dorchester, uh, which we thought was going to be the sort of panacea, but it, it turned out to be quite a busy road village and we didn't want uh, sort of road traffic again. So we found this little quiet bit of Dorchester and it was just coincidental that it happened to be close to the river. Uh, yeah, promise. That was the way it was. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 I believe you. Does that mean then, because you're so close, that you're able to pick those moments? And does it also mean that you're in the rhythm of how the river is, how it's fishing, how the hatches are, what time of day the fish are rising? Do, do you feel a real closeness in more ways than one to, to the river that you're fishing? Yeah, very much so, uh, Pete. Yeah, um, start of the season and through the you know through the Mayflower be out uh, during the day. But as the season settles back and we get into those sort of summer days, not that we've had so many this year, um, obviously. Uh, but um, yeah, you get into a sort of rhythm of summer evenings, and I can sometimes go down several evenings on the trot. Uh, often targeting one fish that I've, you know, risen and flucked it one day, risen, hooked it another day, go back, fish it for a few days later, and it's still there and it's still there. Um, and I often think, oh, this is going to be a monster fish, and then it doesn't quite turn out to be as good as you think it was going to be. But, um, yeah, they're, they're often in the same place, doing the same thing uh, when you get settled weather. But um, not done so much of that this year for obvious reasons. The evenings haven't been so great. Um, yeah, get in the rhythm of the of the seasons for sure. Yeah, and does that mean that you get a feel of what the the state of the river is from a hatch perspective? Have, have you any observations about that? Uh, the hatches aren't as good as they used to be, Pete. Uh, I, I suspect you're going to ask me for my um, upbringing on the river later, and I, you know we can recount as I think probably all fishermen can on the chalk streams and, and other rivers that the hatches aren't as good as they used to be um and we do you know after the the granum we had a very good granum hatch here um and still do that can be very good in the in the spring then the mayfly are uh, prolific and of course they uh, they don't mind the silt that is you know become more prevalent on the river these days uh, so we get a good mayfly hatch but after that uh we're starting to struggle a bit um with the hatches, not so much during the day. Um, if if I'm going to do anything with upwing flies, it'll be blue winged olives evening, and you know, really late on. Um, yeah, which coincides with getting home from work late, and I normally only go out for a, a, you know an hour. Uh, wait and wait and wait, uh, just as it's going, you know, dimpsy dark. That's the time. That sounds as though you've got that perfectly dialed in. And it, it was interesting to hear what you said about the hatches as well, because, and this is for listeners as well, I'd love to to know what people think about this, that at home, certainly where I fish, we usually have big plumes of midges hatching and over the water. And I've noticed this year that there's not been so many. A, do you get many? And B, did you notice there weren't so many around this year? Do you know, I did. Yeah, you're quite right. We do get the midges and, uh, yeah, the little sipper things in, on the evening. It uh, can be good, but uh, I don't know why that is. Um, if anyone can tell me, I'd be, I'd be pleased to know. But uh, maybe it's just the travails of uh, the fly life in general. Um, we're, we're doing some pretty bad things to the river and have been for years. And, um, yeah, maybe that's just a factor of that. Yeah, that's my worry, though, that, you know, that hatch is colossal and it, it really is a, a part of it. Once the mayfly have stopped, it'll be midges and caddis for us coming into the back and there might be some blue winged around as well. But from massive plumes to hardly anything worries me a little bit. And that's, you know, you, you quite often see an erosion of things, don't you, over a period of time. And it might be just like we've said at the very beginning here, or you've said at the very beginning, that the evenings have not been great for it. So that may be something to do with it. But certainly, you know, the way that that's tailed off dramatically causes me a little bit of alarm and something. I'd love, as I said, people listening to this to keep an eye on that as well and see if that's happened too. But like you say, it, it is a worry for us, isn't it? It is, Pete. Um, but the fish are still there. Um, they're eating something because, uh, as you found out the other day, there's some there's some good fish around and they're fat. Um, so they're eating something. Uh, I suspect they're eating quite a lot uh, off the bed, quite a lot of shrimp in, in our river. That, you know, they eat a lot of that. Uh, 
and I think they, um, I think the fish are, are probably more on the bottom than they ever used to be, um, because that's where the food is. Uh, I of, always think now that um, if I was a fish, I, I, I possibly wouldn't venture too much up into the water column, uh, particularly with the number of cormorants that we've got around. Um, I don't know whether that's uh, my own pet theory. I've no idea. Maybe others have got the same the same thoughts that uh, I've been in the river when, um, <clears throat> you know, the Black Death has been uh, swimming by uh, and they move. And if I was if I was a trout, I'd, I'm not sure I want to be up one foot under the surface of the water uh, waiting for one of those to come by. Um, yeah. And if, if the food's down the bottom, maybe they're, they're mainly down the bottom, apart from when the mayfly come in. Yeah. Yeah, I picked something up. I think I was fishing a stream in the area a day before, and I picked something out of the river, and it was caked in gamorous, the shrimp. There was, there was so many of those. And does that mean that that forms part of what you're fishing if you are searching subsurface where you put shrimp patterns on? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I'd, normally a, a, a go-to pattern is a shrimp, yeah. And uh, very much so for the grayling as well. Um, when yeah they take over in the in the autumn, yeah, very much shrimpy flies. Yeah, before we resort to the squirmy wormy, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that said, with a glint in the eye, so I think there's a little bit of a fun with that as well. But um, absolutely, how would you describe yourself as an angler? Oh blimey. Um, I suppose I had um, quite an unconventional start as a as a fisherman. Um, I uh, I didn't start fishing probably until I was in my teens, uh, and I, I guess that's quite unusual. So uh, my dad was a, a farmer. He wasn't a fisherman at all. He was far too busy farming, and um, uh, he was a, a, an absolutely great dad. And we had great fun on the farm and doing stuff uh, around there, but. Uh, farming wasn't for me and fishing wasn't for him. My, um, my grandfather was a, a great fisherman. Um, uh, not that we did a lot of fishing together. We did a tiny bit, but uh, he, he was a bit of a scoundrel, so and probably less said about that. The better. <laughs> but he was a great fisherman, on, and he was a Dorset guy as well. Um, fished the froom for salmon, actually, mainly, um, and was very successful at it. And and caught some um, some monster salmon. Uh, I, I've got a photograph of him with a uh, a fish of thirty seven pounds, um, which is um, which is big by any standard. Uh, there are there are just one or two of those big thirty pounders left in the frame. I, I've never seen one. Um, I haven't caught many frame salmon, but he he would catch his share back in the day. Uh, I've got another photograph of him stood. In front of his um, his old car, which I think was an old Railton car, uh, and it was him stood in front of this car uh, with eight salmon laid out in front of him. Um, of course, they used to kill everything in those days. Uh, didn't know any better, I guess. Um, but yeah, he fished the the froom in its heyday in the fifties and sixties, and a bit into the the seventies as well. He fished, but then the river board uh, bless them. Uh, decided it was a good idea to to um, straighten the channel where he was fishing and take the gravel out um, for flooding purposes. So, <laughs> not quite sure what the what the rationale was behind that, but that's what they did. And he he stopped fishing the frame then. Um, but um, yeah, the fishing is in the blood, uh, I guess, from from uh, grandfather. Um, so I started. Um, at near a at near a village um, upstream from Dorchester, a village called Maiden Newton. Um, I I come back having been at boarding school uh, in my early days. I came back. Uh, my parents moved down to Devon, and um, I was at state school uh, at Beminster. Um, and um, I was got in with some lads at um, at Maiden Newton who uh, were keen on the trout fishing. Uh, they didn't have any permission to fish, and of course, then no did I, and neither did I. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, the trout at Maiden Newton were were well fed. There was a, a bakery there, um, 
Mrs. House's bakery and uh, she used to do the most amazing uh, lardy cake um, and um, she was <laughs> she was a one woman health crisis I reckon in those days uh, back <laughs> every, everyone used to go there for the lardy cake and um, at the end of the day I think she used to chuck all the bread the, you know the, the bad bread out the back of the bakery straight into the river and consequently the trout were pretty fat and some of them were pretty huge up there. So they these guys got me into that and um we used to go in there and poach and lunch trout and it was all good fun. Anyway my my dad got to hear about this and he wasn't entirely happy about it. So he said, uh if you're gonna go fishing you've got to do it properly. You're not having you poaching around the you know back at Mrs. Ace's shop. So um they my parents bought me a fly rod um from Conyers shop in Blandford, which locals will know, still going actually, um, amazingly enough. Um, bought me a fly rod um, and that same bit of fishing um, just downstream of Maiden Newton. Uh, Dad got me a, um, a rod there on a, on a syndicate. Didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, started off fly fishing, uh, learnt my way, didn't know what the flies were. Uh, um, I was looking up this morning some old uh, fishing diaries and I kept a diary for a few years uh, goodness knows why I didn't carry it on but I didn't um, and I could see in the in the first year that I was fishing uh, I was trying to read a bit about it um, and I put down that the I was catching these fish on March browns and I because there are no March browns in the frame they were granum um, but I must have had some sort of fly that uh, did the business and um, I started that way yeah and sort of carry, carried on from there. Fished the Froom a bit, and there's another river um, over the sort of hill from the Froom. The other way, not the Piddle, which is the sort of sister river to the Froom, uh, but the other way, the River Bride, which is a fantastic little river, actually. Um, comes out of the chalk, but is is mixed um, geology again. There's a bit of clay in there, so it colours up a bit. But there was some good trout in there, and I used to go down there a bit and fish. Um, yeah, so that's how I... That's how I started. Uh, and I, I'm, if you asked me to float fish, I would not have a clue how to do it, Pete. Not a clue. Um, uh, I'd do a bit of spinning, or used to, for salmon, uh, and used to do a bit of worming and prawning as well uh, for salmon back in the day. So I know you had to do that a bit, but float fishing stuff, not, not a clue. Um, yeah, so don't ask me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that lovely that your parents saw what the potential in there and encouraged it? And that's that must have been wonderful to have them behind you to say, right, okay, we're going to kick you out. We're going to get get you to be able to do this properly. And and it's had a, a long lasting and profounding effect on you as a as a an angler, really, isn't it? Well, I suppose so. Uh, yeah. I, I, Goodness knows what they thought they were getting. I was getting myself into, but um, it's been a lifelong uh, passion. Um, and, and they wouldn't have known um, what the thing to buy was. I guess I probably went thinking about it. I probably did go with my grandfather to get that first fly rod. He would have said, "This is what you need." It would have been a glass rod, um, nothing like that um, wand you were waving about the other day. That that was a, there. Yeah, that's a special rod. But this was old glass technology, which was a bit heavy and a bit crude. Um, but it sort of, yeah, it sort of did the business. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I, I carried on from there. Um, got more knowledge. Started tying a few flies. Terrible things to start with, obviously, um, and, and not good enough to catch the the free trade. Um, I used to cycle from the farm, um, which was uh, at a, near a place called Askerswell, which is a very hilly part of Dorset, and uh, and it was cycling all the way. So I had to cycle to go fishing. And it was only probably six or seven miles, I suppose. Um, no, less than that. Five miles, say. Um, but it was very hilly. Uh, so I used to cycle there, um, have a day's fishing, and then after the gloaming had finished, I'd cycle back in the dark. Probably didn't have any you know, lights on or anything. Um, but uh, cycling down that <coughs> dual carriageway between Dorchester and Bridport, didn't think anything of it. Um, yeah, that used to be a day's fishing. And did you realise how much of an impact that fishing 
had made on you. And it's, of course, with you to this very day. But were there times where you sort of fell out of love with it a little bit? And of course, we think about when we're getting into those teenage years and other things start to interest us. But has it been a constant or did you step away from it for for any period of time? Um, not for very long, Pete. No, um, not for very long at all. I, um, as I say, my parents moved from uh, Dorset down to Devon when I was 16. So I was doing, um, just started doing A-levels. And, uh, and, and I stayed in Dorset at, at this state school, which had a boarding house to it in those days. Um, so I was I was left behind in Dorset, which I secretly loved. I, I, I absolutely loved boarding school, you know, the prep, prep school. Age seven, I was, um, you know, you hear people say I was sent away to boarding school at age seven. Well, um, uh, I, I absolutely loved it. I, I, I played quite a lot of sport, so cricket and hockey uh, and tennis. Uh, I, I, I was sort of okay at those. So I, I, I spent a bit of time doing that, and I maybe sort of stepped away from doing a bit of fishing then. Um, <clears throat> but I was soon back to it. So uh, parents would have moved to Devon, which uh, took me away from the Froome and Chalk Streams and stuff and down to the neck of the woods that you know best. Um, and, uh, yeah, I started doing some sea track fishing and salmon fishing down there, um, which hooked me even more. Uh, I was, yeah, I was besotted with the sea track for a while. <laughs> and I haven't been back recently. Uh, well, we'll have to do something about that. But was there an adjustment for you going from those chalk streams and the style of fishing that you were doing there comparable to, you know, I'm, I'm guessing and, and, and what I've seen is that, you know, you can fish to fish, whereas here that you're generally going to fish to fish if you see them rising but you will fish the water as well. Was there much of a change and did it take you long to figure out how differently you needed or wanted to fish? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I turned around and faced the other way for a start and that was yeah. much <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um <clears throat> But uh, yeah, a bigger kit, uh, getting in some sort of slightly bigger rivers, um, fishing at the right time, you know, fish were... You have to uh, find right time of day as well for the sea trade, obviously. Uh, fishing at night time was, um, uh, was a bit of a revelation. Uh, quite enjoyed that. Um, and got hooked on the, you know, the, the, the drug of the tug, as they call it, um, of those sea trade giving you a proper pull. Uh, didn't catch many salmon in those days. Um, uh, we'll come on and talk about the half moon in a, in a bit, I guess, but, um, not many salmon in those days. That was that would be the eighties then, which is probably better than it is now. But there didn't seem to be a huge amount around. Um, but yes, different style of fishing, um, and yeah, got me hooked on doing more salmon fishing. I guess up uh, went to started then going to Scotland a bit, um, and yeah, and then further afield after that. But yeah, Scotland a tiny bit. We'll come on to the travelling a little bit later, but you know, you talked about sea trout pretty much straight away and then on to salmon. Does that mean that trout was still there or did things change a little bit for you and you thought, actually, I like these sea run fish and I want to have a go at those and, and you sort of put trout to the side a little bit or were they still part of your life? They weren't part of my life, no. I, I almost switched completely. Um <clears throat> The, uh, there was a little river um, that's a tributary of the Torridge called the Ockmont, and my parents had moved from Dorset to Devon, and they bought a farm um, that had the Ockmont running right alongside it. Um, and, well, that was sort of manna from heaven as well. I thought it was going to be. I thought, uh, well, this river's going to have some sea trout in it, but it didn't really until... I don't think I ever caught a sea trout over there. They used to the salmon and the sea trout used to come up in the autumn and spawn a lot. Used to see them up there in the winter uh, and lots of them as well. Um, you know, big numbers of salmon. Um, but the trout were the, the trout were a bit wee. Uh, they weren't 
They weren't big. They were just the odd one or two big cannibal ones that I used to chase after. But um, no, it, it, I was besotted with the sea trek for sure. You know, I, I used to go um, when I was uh, down there and and helping on the farm. Um, I would uh, I would go to the torridge beats of the half moon, probably at I guess it was four o'clock in the morning or less, you know, earlier than that in the high summer. Um, and fish quite a long way up the torridge on the half moon beats and um, catch mainly school peel, but they were, they were, you know, two, two and a half pounds and they were, you know, they were good, nice sea trout. Banged them on the head naturally, as you did in those days. Um, but um, yeah, I go there at three, four o'clock in the morning, fish in the morning till, you know, it was light and the sun was up and then I go back, uh, go back farming uh, in the daytime. Um, that was the way it was. Yeah. And so, how did sea trout? How was it that you moved there, and then sea trout became the target species? And was that a learning process for for you, or did you figure it out, or did you have someone sort of gently push you in the in the, in the direction you needed to go? Well, I I've worked at the Half Moon Hotel in Sheepwash. Um, which was in those days, um, it was owned by the, the Innes family, the, the Innes brothers, um, Charles, Charlie, I think we used to call him, but I think he'd like to be called Charles, um, and Benji, ben, uh, Benji, yeah, uh, who had the bar. And I used to work in the bar. Um, and I got to know um, Charles through a Hatherley Cricket Club. Um, which was uh, a, a great club in those days, quite vibrant. Uh, there were some, there were some lively lads that uh, played there, and um, I'd arrived from Dorset and was a sort of okay bowler. I, I was, um, I probably wasn't even in the first team very much. I was in the second team. I wasn't. A, there were some proper quick bowlers there in those days. Uh, I won't name them, but um, they, yeah, they were they were pretty rapid. Anyway, Charlie Innes used to do. He played a bit in the second team. And he used to do the ground as well. And um, we got chatting and he said, why don't you come and uh, work in the bar um, in the holidays? I was a, I would have been at uh, college by then. Uh, I went to um, Sirencester Agricultural College. Um, good job. It was a college in those It's a university now. And um, I, I don't think my A-level grades would have been uh, good enough to um, <laughs> get in the university. <laughs> I was, having been having been left in Dorset um, at age sixteen, my I went off the ball a bit with um, with learning A levels, and I ended up with some pretty drastically bad A level results. But I played, yeah, I, I was pretty good at snooker by the time I got to the age eight. Anyway, <laughs> I, I digress. Um, yeah, so uh, Charlie Charles got me. Uh, the job at the Half Moon Hotel in Benji's Bar um, back in the day, and I can I can still remember the beers that we had on tap, uh, which was Courage Best and Courage Directors, and I think it was about a five pence difference in the two, probably sixty p and sixty five p or something. Um, anyway, um, it was a and still is. Uh, a fishing hotel. Um, well, it was a fishing hotel then, so the owners were the, the fishermen. I, th- I know Charles still does fishing out of the Half Moon Hotel, so you can go and stay there and still go fishing. Um, and probably the same beat. Um, but um, he uh, he encouraged me to do the, the sea track fishing, and I got and I got doing that. So when we used to go in the evening uh, to run the bar, and in those days, uh, dinner was served at eight o'clock um which in hindsight seems a bit odd that you would have you, you would keep people to strictly having the, the gong used to sound at eight o'clock and everyone used to file in for dinner and of course they never used to come out again um from you know they get going on the dinner and the wine and all the rest of it and so come nine o'clock i suppose it was in high summer um Charlie used to come out and occasionally he'd say, right, Richard, we're, we'll 
go off and see if we can find some sea track. And uh, just one or two or three days we did that. But uh, they stick in my memory those days with uh, with Charlie. Um, uh, but otherwise, I would be um, on my own down there. Um, and I think the other uh, factor in sea trout fishing, particularly hotels where you have guests that sort of fancy it now and again, let's go sea trout fishing. They get to the wilds of mid Devon, North Devon, and they're out on the river in midsummer at nine o'clock and it's getting a bit darker. And then, I mean, it, for somebody who grew up on a farm, it doesn't bother me at all, but I'm pretty sure it does bother quite a few people when it starts to get dark and they're on their own and, uh, you know, the owl starts to hoot. And um, some of those cows that you, you know, when it's dead dark and you stumble across them and they get up and, you know, snort and go, I can I just think that could be a bit scary. But I didn't used to mind the dark uh, and fishing on my own right through. And I only used to fish, you know, quarter to 10 till half past 11 or something like that and then the best of it was probably done I, they always used to tell me if you stay later you catch the you know the real lunkers and i never did catch one of the really big sea track but i probably had enough and was going to go back to work the next day so half past 11 was probably about the limit of it um but i can still picture those uh beats on the on the torridge um in those days like they were they were famous beats i guess that the half moon had and they, they probably still have them um the one that it sticks out in my mind always and it will with everyone i think because it's such a pretty beat is brimblecombe um which is uh sort of halfway down the torridge i suppose but it's uh it's a delightful bit of water quite steep very wooded valleys which sort of draw you in and i guess heighten the senses a bit um with those a bit scared of that sort of thing but um yeah brimblecombe was the place and it, uh, Charlie took me to Brimblecombe one evening I remember um, and I can I can still picture it as if it's it, it must be 35 40 years ago now and I can it's amazing how um, in fishermen's mind's eyes I guess we, we can almost transport ourselves back to the exact spot I could I could probably drive there well I think I could who knows whether I can, but I could probably drive down the access way to it, down the track, uh, how you get across the river. There was a ladder and stuff to get across, and you, you'd fish it from, you'd drive down the left-hand bank and then go across, uh, get onto the right-hand bank. And there was a there was a pool down there um, called the, the Bump, um, and it's a, a sort of very nondescript bit of water uh, you just walk past it if if you didn't know, but of course Charles knew exactly what was what, and he used to know. He used to tell us um, if he wasn't there himself. There's, I think there were two trees or something on the left hand bank where you were trying to catch these fish, um, and I think there are some. It, it's a completely flat surface, apart from just you can just if you look really carefully, you can see a few boils, and that gives away the fact that there's some. I think there's some slate or shale or something that comes out, some ledges anyway, some rock ledges. And the, there was quite a long uh, pool below it. So the, the fish must have come up to the ledges and maybe the rested behind there. And, um, anyway, that one evening that Charles took me down there, he, it, I won't try and do his voice because he's got quite, he's got quite a distinctive voice, but I, I would re remember him saying, right, Richard, this is going to be a bit of a military operation. Uh, we're not going to start fishing, and this would have been mid-June, I suppose. We're not starting fishing until the usual stuff. You know, you can't see the colour in the grass or the trees anymore, um, and the bats are starting to fly back. Uh, we don't get into the water till then. And I guess it was particularly so with this quite still pool. You didn't want to be crashing about with ripples all over the place. But he was very clear, and he said, we've, um, we've only got half an hour at this job. Probably that's it. And mid-June, it would have been... It was probably 10 to 10. You know, it would have been that precise. It's, t it's 10 to 10, Richard, we're going to start fishing. You're going to go first. You're going to cast down to that place. And, you know, this is the angle. And you're you're going to catch one. I thought, well, am I? Okay, well, okay, that's what we'll do. You're going to catch one. But for goodness sake, don't just stand there. Move down to 
the side of the pool, right hand side in the inside bank, and play your fish. And then I'll come in behind you, and then I'll catch one, and we'll go round. Um, and lo and behold, um, it happened exactly as he predicted it would. I don't know whether it was because the fishing was just right, the river was up a little bit, and the fish are in, or whatever. I don't know, but it happened exactly like that. Um, I hooked one, and it was. Um, I got a feeling I lost it, um, so it wasn't quite as it should have been. But um, I, I remember taking it down to the side. I thought I must get out of Giles's way because uh, he's coming down after me. So I took this fish down. I, I think I lost it, and then he caught one in behind me. Um, and then I th- then I think I did go round and catch one, and that was it. So we had one each, and that was probably half an hour's fishing, and then we were back to the pub, and um, yeah get them as they were coming out of the dining room they wouldn't have known in they were none the wiser probably um they've been in the dining room all the guests and uh i'd <laughs> we got some sea trout from under their noses yeah anyway that was yeah those were those were good days i enjoyed those those half moon days yeah, that's a beautiful story, and thank you for sharing that. And putting this in context for people, because many people listening probably won't know, they may have heard of the Half Moon, its reputation does precede it, but it's in the back of nowhere. It really is, and I, I've been, I was there in January around that neck of the woods, and it really is, and we've got some friends who own a pub in Black Torrington, which isn't a million miles away, called the Black River Inn, and that's worth visiting, I have to say, actually, if you're in the area and have something to eat because Jill and I have done an amazing job there. But it's in the back of nowhere. But these were in the Halcyon days of fishing hotels. And you talked about this dinner at eight, and these things were completely different then. And I know the Fox was similar, and there were many other places. I'm sure the Arundel was doing the same as well, that the the, the gong went and you went down for dinner you had what was for dinner all the fishermen sat around one table I'm guessing this was similar and it wasn't so much about the food I'm sure it was very good as well if I remember rightly and we'll come on to the book shortly but it wasn't about that people were there to fish weren't they yeah absolutely yeah it was very much a fishing hotel had a you know the rod room or I used to go there in the morning and there was a there was a slab of slate with a it was like a glass case and um there was a um it used to mainly be fish filled with uh fish caught by I'm pretty sure he was called Dave Piper, who was a local fisherman, uh not a guest at the hotel. He he would catch all the you know, the fish where nobody was fishing. Um, but he used to catch some big sea trout. Um and they used to be on the slab and then the other sea trout you know, from the guests would come in and lay beside it. Um, but yeah, proper fishing hotel. And if I remember correctly, um, I'm not sure I used to go in the dining room. Um, probably not allowed. Uh, I was, you know, had to stay in the bar, this young, you know, barman. Stay in there, Richard. Um, look after the bar. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was a, a fixed menu. I'm pretty sure if, if, if probably no vegetarian option either, but uh, who knows? But, um, I'm pretty sure it was just this is what you're eating. There's no there's no choice. Um, just have what you're given, and it, it, everyone bought into that. Um, I did look it up actually when when I knew I was going to do this. I thought I better just see if the half moon is still about and doing what it sort of used to do. And of course, it, it's sort of not quite the same. But I did look at the menu, and I thought, well, they've sort of kept to the tradition because it's not a it's not a great long menu like you see in some places where you wonder. You know, how do they have all that on the menu and keep it fresh? Um, but it looks to me as though they, they do sort of hold to that um, principle that the less that's on the menu, the, the better. And I think I probably subscribe to that still to this day. Yeah. And you, you were saying that, you know, fishing hotel, that's exactly it. And I know obviously the Fox, the Arundel, and I was driving along the tour to go fishing yesterday and I drive past the Fox and then there was a place, I think it was the Fortescue Arms, if I remember rightly, there's on the junction of the Mole and the Tour, there's the Rising Sun, these places. Do you think that these fishing hotels, because there aren't really that many now in their own right. Do you think the change or the demise of them was a function of 
the turning and the 80s I know was a difficult time wasn't it for salmon as well that 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 was the turning point for these sorts of establishments and they've continued to try to keep on some have made it some haven't but they've had to evolve just a little bit but do you think that is a lot to do with the demise of salmon that was even happening back there I think possibly so, yes, Pete. I remember Charles saying to me in those days in the 80s, he said, oh, this is nothing like it used to be. And, of course, it wasn't, um, but I was none the wiser, really. Um, and the sea trade were still okay then, but the, the salmon were, were definitely on the on the demise. And, um, yeah, that's probably right that the, the fishermen stopped coming, but maybe they were, um, maybe they were off to exotic climbs as well in those days started going to other places you know more of the the airlines would have been getting going then i suppose in those days uh so you didn't have that slog north maybe to scotland and you could go to ireland and who knows norway and other places so maybe there was a bit of that going on as well um but um the fishing hotels these days that are left um I don't know, I have no idea, but they, they seem to be doing okay, uh, but in more in terms of teaching how to fish. You can go there for a course, because um, it seems to me there's a there's a bit of a move towards um, the older generation picking up fishing in later life, um, and maybe the pandemic's got something to do with that, that everyone had a bit of a reset of what was important in life. And those of us that were lucky to grow up fishing didn't need to be taught anymore but um maybe there is the move now to come for a week's course on how to start fishing and get going on that um yeah no no feeling your way like i did back in the day you get some proper good um you know instruction on how to do it i never had a, a i'm sad to say this pete because i know you, this is what you do but i've never had a casting lesson or or any lesson or in fact I think I could probably count the guided days that I've had um, in, on the fingers of one hand. Um, even in New Zealand, we, we, when we went over there, we, we tried to do our own thing, which is not that guiding is a brilliant thing. And of course, if you're short on time or short on res, you know res, time resource to do it, guiding and teaching is the only way to, to do it, and it's the brilliant way to do it. It's a short, it's a shortcut to getting to do what we all do. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that's, I guess, what they're up to there, the, the fishing hotels. Yeah. Um, I should say, I, sh- I, sh- I should add that, um, although I said there weren't many salmon around in, in those days, I did catch my first salmon at the half moon. Um, I didn't use, there's a, there's a beat right down the bottom called a beam, which you'll know, I'm sure, which is the first weir off the tide. And the, the fish used to stop there a bit, um, or a lot. Uh, it's one of the places where they catch the some spring fish on there these days. And it was spring. Um, again, I looked it up yesterday. I did just about keep a diary until catching my first salmon, and I uh, inked it in in red. So there it was. But I was – child. I had a friend's father was staying at the Half Moon, and uh, Charles said, uh, Richard, well, you know this guy. You've not only guiding, but you and him, are, you know, know each other. You take him down to be where and um, see what you can do down there. So it should be quite good. This was in April, um, and um, so me and Jack went off to fish beam, and we went round. I think you normally fish it off the left bank from memory, the, the weir pool, um, but we'd gone round the other side and fished. Um, and again, it's one of those. Uh, scenes that I is imprinted in high definition in my memory um, is I think it's called Sunken Tree Pool, which is just down below um, Bean Weir, and uh, Jack hooked um, what turned out to be, I think it was a six pound sea trek, and he he didn't know any better, and I didn't know any better. We both thought it was a salmon. And in those days, um, of course, whacked it on the head, as you did. Um, in those days, you could catch one fish and then you had to stop fishing. So, And he caught this first cast, this six-pound sea trap. Um, so he and I looked at each other and said, well, I'm not sure we're going to do now. It was only about nine o'clock in the morning. And he said, well, he said, I've caught my fish. You better 
you'd better have to have a go. And I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll have a go then. Um, and lo and behold, um, I hooked a fish that on the first cast, we had two casts, and um, I hooked, well, this was a proper salmon. Uh, this was, you know, 11 pounders. Eh? Um, it was a proper fresh salmon straight off the tide. Um, so we were done in about, again, half an, <laughs> half an hour. Um, uh, and uh, he caught, we took it back to the hotel. And Charles said, he said, well, it's a sea trek. Um, you can go back and, he said, you can go back and catch the salmon. Anyway, Jack was, I don't know, we didn't go back for some reason. I don't know why, because it was obviously hot on the fish that day. But he, I think he had his wife with him. And he's, having gone back to the hotel, it would have been a bit mean uh, to have turned around again and said I'm off again to catch another one. So uh, anyway, I was done because I'd caught the salmon. Um, so that was it for the day. He did go back the next day to um, uh, Brightly, which was another beat on the Torridge, a bit further up, I think. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it must have been uh, further up. And uh, he caught the salmon straight away. I saw him catch it. Um, and I didn't for some reason. He, he Again, he killed it. Um, but he caught his fish and then he was off again. Yeah, so it was a short... <laughs> It was short and sweet doing the fishing in those days. Well, in the, on those days that we caught those fish, yeah, he was done and dusted and off shopping in Great Torrington by 10 o'clock. Yeah. If he was shopping there, he'd be back by quarter past 10 as well. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's not a lot there. But it's if you're getting a sense of this as, as listeners as well, and um, Charles wrote a book called Torridge Reflections, which talks about the history, because I think the pub was first bought by his father after the war. And it's a wonderful look into running a fishing hotel, the highs, the lows, the fall of the salmon runs as well. And I know when I was working over at the Fox on the, the sister river, the tour, that I got a bit of flack because people, oh, they're not going for salmon. They're not. And we'd go for salmon when there was water for it. But we could take people trout fishing seven days a week, which is what we concentrated on doing. And it reminded me of the Ockman when you mentioned that, that Josh, who I took for his first day salmon fishing, it was one of those dream situations that he'd never done it before. And I said, well, quietly fancy it. And you should never say that as a guide anyway. But I did. And he hooked a salmon, landed a salmon, his first one. We went somewhere else and he dropped a salmon that he had on then he landed another one and i said look we're finishing six is half six i've got a friend staying uh is it right if we all fish together when we're finished and of course that pulse of salmon had disappeared by then so the river felt absolutely alive when those things happen are wonderful but it's definitely worth a read i got my book from kokibundu um and it's a really really lovely read have you read it I've got it. Yeah, I've got it sat in front of me. Because I, I, we were talking about the torridge, I thought I'd just flick through it. And I, I, I see, um, yeah, uh, I've, and I had a little read of it again yesterday, yeah, which brought back some yeah, some proper memories. Yeah, it's a lovely book. Um, yeah, and um, he's obviously still going strong, Charles, still absolutely besotted with the, the, um, the torridge salmon. I, I really must um, get back in touch and and go and have a day with Charles. Maybe maybe we won't go back to the bump, um, but we'll go because that would sort of, you know, how it's, you'd never go back to those places that you've got in your mind's eye, but go back to somewhere different yeah, and yeah. spend a bit of time there. Yeah, Absolutely. I've only met him a couple of times. and One of them, I was a bit in awe, but he came over to me and said, oh, I love what you're doing at the Fox a, a number of years ago. And I was just too starstruck to say, much else. I just said, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Innes. And that was it. I was just so pleased to have met him and for him to say some kind words. But yeah, I, I can't recommend the book. It, it, it's just great fun. And I really, really enjoyed reading it. But I, I, I wanted to move on a little bit from there. And you said that you, you mentioned New Zealand, you talked about other uh, fishing. Does that mean that you like, we, you can get pulled away from these chalk streams of Dorset and go fish some other places? Yeah, very much so. I've been uh, very lucky, uh, Pete, all, all through my life. I've um, I've definitely married the right woman uh, in Mandy. She's, uh, she's a, yeah, I love it a bit. And she has brought me out of my uh, 
shell probably i, I think I, maybe like many other fishermen i'm, a, I'm a, maybe a bit naturally hermit like and uh I, you know I, I like being on my own uh but um she's uh brought me out and said but you got to she's pushed me on in my professional life um which has been reasonably successful um and in traveling wise uh she and i have a uh, great travelers we we don't travel every year all over the world uh, and stories about fishing all over the world these are just once in a while i don't go every year to you know these exotic places but uh, just once in a while we'll pick a place um and um she she doesn't usually come with me on the fishing trips but uh, we've done one or two together and i'll uh, maybe talk to you about uh sitka in alaska which is a, it's an amazing place but new zealand um we did do that together actually uh, once we um we flew around the world and visited some places um in, i think we did it in a fortnight which was just a crazy i think it was a fortnight maybe a bit longer than that but we were going to a wedding in australia uh so we went there and then we thought well we'll just carry on so we went to new zealand a bit and i had half a day um fishing with a guide in new zealand i got the sort of yeah i can see what this place is all about so I thought I'm going to come back here one day. And then we flew on to uh, Hawaii. And um, again, I'd sort of, you know, the devil in me had sorted out a bit of fishing as we went round. Just half a day again. Um, with uh, We went to, um, Mandy used to work for um, the Americans uh, in a school, American school. And... Um, she had some Ameri- we had some American friends who lived on Oahu, uh, just north of Honolulu, at a place called uh, Kaneohe Bay. Uh, and well, I just these days you could Google it, so I googled it, and I well, lo and behold, it turns out to be one of the best places to catch uh, bonefish. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll see if there's any guiding going on here. So I booked half a day. It's very expensive, um, but. My God, uh, yeah, and it's again one of those species that a bit like the bumper at Brimblecombe. I dare not go back because it, I had half a day uh, lucked out completely. I caught three bonefish that were over eight pounds in half a day, um, and um, well, I thought, well, this <laughs> this is this is a bit easy. This bone, well, they weren't easy <laughs> to catch. They weren't easy to catch um, or land anyway. They were. They were okay to catch. Uh, I couldn't see them. Um, uh, I had a guide. Uh, I think he was, I can't remember his surname. He was called Captain Rick. Uh, same name as me. Um, so I remember his name. And he was up on this skiff, and we were on the flats, Canio Head Bay. Um, and it was it was not uh, sort of typical Bahamas. Not that I've been to the Bahamas, but that sort of scenery going on. There was a military base just across from where we were fishing, so these aircraft were coming in and out, really noisy, um, sort of quite busy around on the bank. But these bonefish are up on this flat, my God, and he could see them. I couldn't see them, um, as you'll know, Pete. I, I can't see anything without any glasses on. But I've got pretty strong glasses, so my vision's okay, but I'm not good enough to see these bonefish. He could see them, so he was telling me, uh, yeah, you know, usual thing. And I could cut. I could cast pretty well, okay, using his gear. Um, and he would say, "One o'clock, twenty yards." And I could, I could get it out there, and he'd, then he'd go, you know, strip, 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 stop, stop, strip, and then you get older one. And then, as you know, have you have you done bone fishing? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then all the hell, as you know, breaks loose, and uh, this thing is gone to the horizon. And the first one, actually, I, I, it broke off on some coral. And so that was a bit disappointing. It was sort of having wound it in 300 yards or something, uh, using the wrong hand. I have a right-hand winder, which is, I know, terrible. But um, these reels that I had from this guide were left-hand wind. So I was started trying to wind it left-hand and then had to turn it up on its So the reel was above the rod, so I could right-hand wind it. It was pathetic, really, but... Um, anyway, yeah, this first thing one broke me off. I thought, well, that's going to be that. Anyway, long story short, I caught three more over eight pounds. Um, and so that's my bone fishing stuff. Um, 
what were we talking about? Music. Oh, and then I carried on to, I carried on to, um, or we carried on to Texas, which was some more American friends. And I'll, if we're going to talk about Sitka, they're Texans, and we stopped there. And I, I won't talk to you about small bass, bass fishing because it's hardly worth. Anyway, Larry, who's the Texan, and his lovely wife Jana, Larry had got me. He said, "I know you like fishing, so I'm going to get you smallmouth bass fishing on Lake." fork i think it was called huge thing looked like a sea and all they were really interested in was getting the biggest boat with the largest triple outboard engine going at 70 miles an hour across the lake i think we caught one bass or something anyway the the boat trip was definitely more exciting than the fishing um, <laughs> but yeah uh new zealand um yeah I've, I've been back um with uh some mutual friends friend in john applin is part of our party john grindle actually was part of the first party but um i think we shot him to bits on the first <laughs> the first trip <laughs> so but john applin has been back with us um and other great mate john thorpe so lots of johns yeah three johns they'd be called keeper jt and foodie i think john grindle was because he's a great <laughs> food buff um uh yeah we did that just one trip and then we've done two trips since um and we've done it all on the back of um a combination of uh a fishing book and i've got it in front of me and it's called uh south island trout fishing guide by john kent and it's pages i now have to keep in with an elastic band because i've thumbed through it so many times uh getting the right rivers to go and fish so we've we've sorted it all out ourselves um i'm a um surveyor and land agent uh by trade so i can i can read a map um and i've been put in charge of reading the map finding the rivers and there's some good base maps that you can get for new zealand you can drill right down to where the tracks are and how you get into rivers and google earth um has sorted us out on um where to go in new zealand you, you sort of look at a big uh wide shot of the area you think you might want to fish and we've learned that if you look on google earth the little green streaks that go through the arid bit of the we fish quite a lot of the mackenzie plain which is sort of high dry arid area of new zealand uh, we found that to be our bit that we like the best but these green bits that go through the arid bits are the are the spring creeks the spring rivers um they look they look a bit like the Froom. Um, which is a good start. You can see, you obviously see into them, you know, because that's um, what they are in New Zealand. But they, um, there's, a, there's some good fly hatches. And we have been going in mar end of March and through April, which is sort of our autumn, their autumn. Um, sorry, our spring, their autumn. Um, and the fly hatches... Uh, you don't get the cicadas. The cicadas are done, so you're missing all that sort of stuff. But uh, the upwinged flies are out, and they've been rising fish, and they're, you know, they're just amazing. But we drive we drive a long way off the beaten track to get to them. We've worked it out on a map that we we and we get a good four wheel drive, um, no camper vans or anything like that. We, well, we couldn't have a camper van anyway. The three of us. Like we snore, particularly one of the parties snore terribly. Um, so no camper vans, uh, good four wheel drive, a land cruiser type, um, and drive for this one river that has become our favourite. We drive for about an hour, and it's a proper bumpy ride. But when you get there, it is well, just amazing. Yeah, fish rising, and yeah, good. Um, the other thing that's changed in New Zealand, and probably is one of the factors that I was listening to, um, is it Bob Wyatt who was talking about New Zealand a bit, saying it's changing a bit. Yes. More yeah. and, and more, more and more people fishing there. We found that a little bit um, because we go later in the season. Um, it's not quite so busy, um, but even so we've noticed a few more people than there used to be. And one of the factors I think is that when we first went there with the four of us, um, there was no Airbnb and, we hadn't booked anywhere apart from the first night we got off the plane. So we were just winging it and we were 
you know, we'd go to a river and after a while, one of us would say, well, we'd better go and find something to sleep. Um, so we'd drive up and down the roads in the villages in New Zealand. Quite often they'd have a sign outside, um, you know, B&B or house for rent, usually, nobody there. You just ring the number and they tell you the code and you'd wander in and leave some cash in an envelope. Uh, you know, really trusting. But Airbnb has changed all that. So now you don't have to rely on that bit of chance of getting a place. You can, as we were driving on from river to river, one of us stuck in the back, mainly John Applin, because he's he's not allowed to, he's not allowed to drive <laughs> on quite a lot of the roads. He, yeah, he gets a bit scared of the high stuff. Um, so yeah, he's not allowed to drive. He's in the back and he he does the B and B and books it. Um, and yeah, yeah, you're there. It's just, you know, usual stuff. Yeah. But I think that's brought, it's made it a lot more accessible to a lot more people doing that. Um, consequently, you see more people about it. And, and New Zealand itself, I think, has seen that it's got to re- start relying on more commercialization. Um, it's not a, it doesn't seem to be a particularly rich country. I mean, it's absolutely a brilliant country for visitors, but um, I, I'm not sure there's a huge amount of money around for the, the nation, as it were. Um, but yeah, uh, that's a that's a great place to to visit. Fantastic! That sounds an amazing trip, and great company, great fishing, and a great plan. And I know often if I go to the American Midwest, similar, I tend to go at the back end of the season, so end of September. That did coincide with when I was guiding that uh, the season would finish here, and I'd jump on a plane and and head to the Midwest and it was a little bit quieter and looking at those non-prime times can be a a good way to think about trips um, to some of these places but we've we've spoken over an hour now and I just wanted to touch very very quickly before we start winding towards the end of this and you're secretary of the Dorchester Angling Club and I, I know when we fished a stream that you took us and showed us some of the main river there and you talked a little bit about it. And the fascinating thing for me is that I said, just out of interest, uh, is there much of a waiting list? And you said to me, actually the waiting list is closed and the waiting list for those on it is about 10 years. That's an amazing story. And I try and highlight fishing clubs within this podcast and what, what do you think the reason for that is? Is it the running of it? Is it the size of membership? Is it a combination? Is it the fishing itself? Or is it a combination of a, a number of things? I'm not sure, Pete. By the way, I should correct. It's the Dorchester Fishing Club. There is a Dorchester Sorry. Angling Club. Sorry, um, apologies. Dorchester Angling Club is a, is a course fishing club. Sort of, we're not connected in any way, but uh, we're Dorchester Fishing Club and um, have been around since uh, 1877. So. Uh, by my calculations, and I've just realised this, we need to be starting to prepare for our 150th anniversary anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been secretary for, uh, again, I looked it up this morning, unbelievably, 15 years. When I And I took over from our good friend, uh, John Grindle. He was secretary before me. Um, and he said, uh, he said, I, uh, he said, I've retired because the guy before me only did it for 13 years or something, and I've done one more year than him. So I, anyway, it seems as though I'm in Clover now, and I've done 15 years. I've done more than John. So if anyone fancies taking it over, then you're welcome. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> no, I'm not, I'm not serious about it. I, I love doing it, and it's it's fine. And I should add, by the way, that um, although I'm named as the secretary, when I took it on, um, I said to the chairman at the time i said i'll take it on I'm a bit busy at work but i will take it on because you seem to want me to do it but i said what i don't really want to do is um do the membership stuff where i have to put all the cards together and send them all out so john grindle in a weak moment said well sorry he said i can carry on doing that i said oh, well that's it you know. uh in in doing all the hard work and he does the website as well so that if you look at the website um it's uh, it's all john grindle's work he's a He's a good lad at doing that. He's, it, and it was his profession. He used to do all that, the website stuff in the day. But um, the club itself, what's its success? Um, I don't know. Um, he, there, apparently there was a time back in the 90s or something where um, we were a bit short on membership and, you know, had to um, do an article in the Trout and Salmon and even advertise in the Trout and Salmon magazine for members, I think, before my time, really. but. Um, it's certainly not the case now. Um, 
And we do, yeah, I'm afraid that the membership, we've we've closed it because um, it's a bit unfair to p- people on there and charge them 20 quid to go on the waiting list. And then that's the, that's the last they see of their 20 quid if they don't get in for 10 years. But um, uh, we're, yeah, we're sort of rationalising it a little bit. There, is, there are some on there who I think probably been on there and don't answer when a, an availability does come up. But yeah, it's only usually five or six a year that, that drop out. Um, yeah. Um, but it's a, uh, we, we have a lot of fishing. Um, yeah, I think we've got about 12 miles in, to- we might 12 miles in total on the Froome and the Piddle and the Cern and all the side streams. Um, one of which you fished the other day. So that was off the main river. Um, so all in all 12 miles and we've got about 70 members. I, I lose count slightly because we up it a bit. We took on another beat last year um, and took on another couple of members. Um, but um, we're we're fortunate in that we we're, we're centred around Dorchester. That's our sort of main centre, and the fishing is upstream and downstream of Dorchester. Um, and that we we have the Duchy of Cornwall is our main landlord and has been ever since the start. Um, but we've got some very good other quite benevolent landlords um, who I won't name, but they're, they're great to us. And uh, we keep her it relatively lightly. Um, John Applin is our, um, is our is our keeper. He part-time keepers, he do, as well as all the other things he does. Uh, he keepers our water. And as you will have seen, we're, we're not into manicured banks and yeah, being able to cast through every bit of water. Um, we it's a, it's a relatively light touch keepering some bits including that piece you fished the other day isn't keep it at all uh it's just you know let to do its thing um and um uh <clears throat> the, the subscription is um it's not huge it's 500 quid a bit more than that um so that's you know and there's no uh there's no joining fee um so it's a it's a relatively modest uh amount and the, the fishermen who come seem to like it and they seem to stay we we get a little bit of turnover from quite often new members who think it'd be a good thing to join the club seeing it's a fly fishing club looks like a chalk stream um uh, and the, the fishing is quite tough um the fish can get quite canny uh, and we don't stock it uh we we stopped stocking i would guess five years ago maybe um, and we in, even before that, we only used to lightly stock it, but we don't stock it any longer. So they're all wild fish, apart from one or two stockies that come down from the the, the fishery above, which they they are a commercial enterprise and they do stock theirs. So we get a few of theirs, but otherwise it's wild fish. Um, and we get a bit of turnover from them. They find it quite difficult. It's not the place to come if you're only just learning fly fishing, really. it's um, you, you need to get your eye in on probably some still water stuff. And, Maybe go to some slightly easier waters with some stocked fish in there to get your eye in. Um, but once you're once you're on it, then you know how to fish it. Those that do fish it love it. Um, and I should say, probably of those seventy members, uh, there's there's maybe twenty that are the really keen ones. Um, the, the rest probably uh, we we have some sort of home counties, London members who would come down for the Mayfly and then don't fish much after that. Um, so it gets a little bit busy at Mayfly, but not that you wouldn't, you know, we don't have any, you, this is your beat for the day and you've got to book in advance or anything. We just, we all know where each other park our cars. And if you see a couple of cars in the parking place, just go somewhere else. Um, you'll find somewhere. Even at peak Mayfly time, there's, there's always a place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as to why it's so, um, got such a long waiting list, I guess it's just, you know, a bit like a traffic jam. <laughs> don't need much traffic to make a traffic jam lovely lovely well many congratulations on that and it's wonderful to hear that story as well um we're gonna end now with the nasty question the dreaded question the one that everyone fears can you give me a song for the fly culture spotify road trip playlist can you give me a song wow I thought it was going to be a really hard question, Pete. Something a bit technical about how to <laughs> catch flies on a reduced mid hatch or something. No, the, the 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 song um, 
yeah, I've got a, a quite a wide taste in music from classical through to heavy metal. Um, as you know, as we were driving around the other day, I was showing off a sound system in my car that I only bought the car for the sound system, I think, which is epic. Um, but I'm a I'm a great um, lover of loud music, and um, yeah, I, I I love going to uh, rock concerts and um albeit i've uh, toned down a bit recently uh so we did the killers this year at the o2 uh, fab but we also did the pet shop boys at um uh royal opera house which was a revelation now uh, my wife mandy bless her she loves the opera she won't take me to that because I'm, I'm really into the opera but um I, I, I love the pet shop boys anyway <clears throat> I, of all the concerts i've been to um Number one in in my mind uh, is ACDC, and I saw I've only seen them play once, and I've only seen them play towards the end of their career. Um, and I saw them at Wembley, maybe seven years ago. And um, my stepdaughter Jodie, who also loves late music, um, said it was it, it watching me was pathetic. You know, it was like a little kid <laughs> dancing on the dancing on the spot as ACDC came on. But anyway, uh, ACDC uh, back in black is uh, my entry for the list. I hope. Well, I'm pretty sure nobody else will have it, but maybe they have. But if they have, sorry, I've repeated something. But that's my uh, turn it up in the car music when uh, I've had a good day. Great choice. And I think my hearing has almost come back from sitting in your car and listening to your sound system. I know we had a lot of fun with that. And we went from rock to roll to classical to everything just to enjoy that. But it was absolutely fantastic. Richard, we've spoken well over an hour now, which has been really enjoyable. And I hope listeners will forgive me for letting this run over. But it is our 250th episode so perhaps you might cut me a little bit of slack with that it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you again i thoroughly enjoyed the day that we spent on the river it was such fun and your story is a fascinating one it is an interesting one and i'm sure listeners will enjoy listening to it so i'd like to say a colossal thank you for coming along and talking with me today Thank you for inviting me, Pete. I, I was a bit trepidatious, as like anyone would be, I guess, coming onto the podcast. But it's been—I've enjoyed it very much indeed. And thank you for that. And just luck that you and I got together a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, really good. There's something about small streams, that's for sure. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> the other one's waiting oh. for you. Oh, I'll be there. Don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. Well, everyone, this has been another episode of the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. As ever, there's never going to be any charge for these. I just love talking to people about their lives and how they revolve around fly fishing. And this has been a wonderful example of that. So thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly published magazine owned and run by fly anglers. When it comes to fly fishing, we've got you covered. Mm-hmm.